Well, good morning, First Church. It's really good to be here with you at the beginning of our brand new series, Made for More. And I'm so excited to have this five-week conversation with you guys. And uh, man, as uh, our team was putting together the outline for this series, I just know that we've got a lot of good stuff to talk about that I think is going to be powerful and life-changing. And uh, it's all rooted in the fundamental concept that I think so many of us get, that we were made for more. Deep in our hearts, I think we know this. I don't know if you've ever done this in your life, but I think so much of my life has been, I can't wait until, right? I can't wait. And we're living in the moment. We think, well, uh, you know, I don't feel actualized today, but I know in the future, you know, I can't wait until I get into high school. I can't wait until I get into college. I can't wait until I graduate and start working. I can't wait until I get married. I can't wait until I have kids. I can't wait until my kids are grown up. I can't wait until I retire, right? This can't wait, can't wait. And the thing is, every single moment that we're living in today was uh, I can't wait until yesterday. It's so interesting because when we get there, it's like, man, it's not what I hoped it would be. I feel like I was made for more. I want to talk about that concept today. Now, we just finished up uh, what I think was an exciting and emotional series um, called Outlasters, and that was fun to celebrate as a church. Very, very emotive series. Um, this five-week series is going to be a teaching series, and I want to speak to our minds in addition to our hearts in this conversation. Now, I hope you guys had a great week. I had a great week for so many reasons, okay? I saw Dr. Dobson again. He cracked my back, so I'm not in a ton of pain anymore. Guy has the hands of Jesus. He's just amazing. But uh, I also had a great week because I sold my boat. And uh, I want to be clear before I go into this message, because we're going to talk about boats in this message. I disclosed every single problem very, very clearly. I outlined every one. This guy said, hey, you can stop being honest now because I don't want to hear any more problems about the boat I'm going to buy. I was like, no, I want you to hear them all because I live in this town and I don't want you to tell me I didn't tell you. I, told, I said everything I could possibly say. Now, um, I had had a long-term dream of owning an inboard, direct drive, open bow, fuel-injected ski boat, right? Some of you guys remember early in my time here, I kept talking about this dream. And eventually in 2016, with virtually no budget, I managed to get what I thought was the deal of a lifetime. And I actually looked at the bill of sale. I paid less for this thing than I thought. I paid 3,500 bucks for a boat at NADAs at 11 grand. So I thought, oh man, this is a deal of a lifetime, but you, you get what you pay for. Here's an actual picture of my old boat right here. And um, it kind of looks cool, doesn't it? I mean, you see that, you're like, that's great. But it's sort of like a Tinder pick. It looks great on the internet, but then in real life, you're like, oh, okay. I'm getting up close. I see, I see the problems, right? So we shook hands, we water tested the boat. I get to the guy's house, and he told me he had a clean title for the boat, right? Famous last words. He did not have the title for the boat. He didn't have a trailer title, and he tells me, oh, you know, I have the title, but it's at my uncle's house, and my uncle's out of town for this and that and whatever. I was like, oh, that's yeah, probably fine. You know, he's probably an honest guy, right? I mean, I never met him before, but I'm just going to choose to trust him because I'm a trusting person. So uh, a few weeks later, I get a call from a guy saying, hey, um, you stole my boat. And I was like, I didn't steal your boat. I paid for it. He's like, no, 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 no. You paid my nephew for my boat. And I was like, oh, okay. So that's, that's how it went. He sold his uncle's boat. Anyway, eventually we talk and whatever, and we come to an understanding. And I, I get the boat for 3500 bucks, which is great, with a title. But uh, as I said before, you get, you get what you pay for. And let me tell you, I got what I paid for. I have been stranded more times than I can count in this boat, like kneeling in the front, paddling in, like, oh, that's probably why I have back problems, right? And listen, spare me the jokes, okay? I'm going to say the jokes that I hear a thousand times so that you don't tell me. You know, the second best day in a boat owner's life is the day that he buys a boat. The best day is the day that he sells it. It's true, okay? And uh, you know what boat stands for? Bust out another thousand. Yes, I am aware of that. So aware of that. But listen. <laughs> Every time I get this boat to a mechanic, the thing runs great. Like literally this spring, I'm trying to start it in my garage. It won't start, it won't start, it won't start. So I call a mechanic friend, he comes over, just looks at the boat, like physically looks at the boat, doesn't touch it, looks at it, starts up right away. He's like, yeah, it's probably just need to be defogged, right? Okay, perfect. So I bring it to the boat launch. And here's the actual picture from Instagram of Grant Zachary and I taking the boat out. You probably thought, oh, it looks like they're having fun. Wrong. The boat did not start, okay? We got to the boat launch, and I wore out the batteries, and I put it back on the trailer and brought it back home. And I got it to the mechanic, and guess what happened? It started. 30 times in a row. We couldn't duplicate the problem. I was like, I'm going to kill somebody, right? Well, the mechanic finds what he thinks is the fundamental problem. Wiring harness corroded, blah, 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 right? So he fixes that problem. I bring it back to the boat launch with my dad in great confidence this spring that it's going to start. And it does not start. 
For the record, we got it back to the mechanic and it started like 30 times in a row again. But anyway, I'm sitting on the boat launch with my dad and I, I'm just demoralized. I'm a pretty optimistic person. Like I keep, at this point though, I'm like, I really, I really want to kill somebody. Like I'm just, I'm over this. I feel bad, but um, this, is, this is bad news right here. And uh, so what happens, what happens is uh, I start opening up the engine cover, right? You ever do that? Like when you're 20, oh, I'm actually 30, okay, 33 years old, I open up the engine cover and I just start looking at the engine. And I'm like, why am I doing this? I have no idea what I'm doing. Like, I'm looking at the engine, and I see things, and I start wiggling things. I'm wiggling, like, wires and, and, and hoses, and I realize I don't know the difference between a wire and a hose. Is this a wire? Is this a hose? I don't know. I just, my dad's laughing at me, too, because he knows he's with me, and he knows I need to, like, go to him to borrow a hammer. Like, I don't have tools, right? And so I'm, like, doing things and trying to start it. This is a pretty good image. It shows my skill level with boats. This is a good, like, picture of, like, how good I am with boats. I have no idea what I'm doing. I'm up there. And here's the thing. I knew something was wrong, but I didn't know how to fix it. Have you ever been in that situation? You knew this was supposed to be better, but it's just not what it's, it's not working. It's not what it meant to be, you know? And I think this is what so many people experience in life. Right? This is our experience in life. We're in a boat that we purchase with our choices and actions and dreams. And we thought it would get us where we wanted, but in the end, it's just not what we had hoped it would be. I think so many people experience this in life. Got to get that picture down because many of you are like, oh, dog with a tie on. It's just so cute. We know that we were made for more, right? But we don't know how to get there. Something is broken. Something isn't right. We feel helpless. We're like me trying to fix a bow. We have no idea what we're doing. We just know that we were made for more. Now, in this series, I want to talk about what the God of the Bible has to say about this. And I just want to acknowledge, there are a ton of people at this church with a broad range of beliefs. And we always say, everybody's welcome. No one's perfect. We're just figuring out faith. So I just want to acknowledge, if you're not sure about the God thing yet this morning, I am so glad that you're here. This is a really safe place for you to figure out who Jesus is to you. But I want to tackle this question, and to do that, i got to talk about one of the most controversial issues in America today, and that is the concept of sin. And I think there's a lot of misconceptions and preconceived notions about this concept of sin. I want to hit on that topic, and I want to do it in a way that's going to be uplifting and, and helpful. And again, I want to look at um, what God's Word has to say about that. What we're going to do is we're going to look at this book from the Bible called Romans. And uh, Romans was inspired by God through this guy named Paul. And uh, Paul... Um, Paul was a really amazing person, um, but he was older when he was writing the book of Romans, and he was dictating it. Have you ever dictated to Siri or Google Voice through a text message? I always know when somebody's doing that to me because a text message is like this long and it meanders all over the place, right? Okay, Paul was dictating the book of Romans. So when you read it, you can actually see he's kind of meandering and he's getting to his point, but he uses a lot of words and it's kind of confusing. So I'm going to break that down for you. I want to help you with it. Um, and uh, I want to bring us to what I think is one of the most powerful points in uh, the entire Bible. And uh, so a super important passage on sin. And today what I want to do is I want to talk about five truths regarding sin and boats. Perfect. Five truths regarding sin and boats. And uh, I want to jump right into our passage, Romans chapter 5. It starts off in verse 12 here um, on the topic of sin. Paul says, when Adam sinned, sin entered the world. Adam's sin brought death. So death spread to everyone, for everyone sinned. You can totally see he dictates that. Like that is, like Paul got to the end of that and he was like, well, that was confusing, but I can't backspace, paper's expensive, we're just moving on, right? Um, but here's what he's saying. All of us were born into the boat of sin. I'm going to show you guys an analogy today, and at first you're going to be like, wait, I'm not sure I understand that, but by the end you're going to be like, that makes total sense to me, okay? So I want you to stay with me because I'm going to progressively reveal this analogy to you. It's going to make more and more and more sense, okay? All of us were born into what I call the sin boat, okay? This is the boat of Adam. That's what that verse said, Adam's sin. This is the sin boat right here. There's a picture of my old boat because it was a sinful boat. I put it up there right there, and all of us, we were born into this boat, right? I was born into this boat. Uh, my kids, oh gosh, my kids were totally born into that boat for sure, no doubt there. Uh, my parents, my wife, um, my wife, I'm just going to put that right there for now, okay? Mother Teresa, Billy Graham, you know, all, everybody. Zachary, I know that's hard to believe. Zachary's amazing, but he was born into the sin boat. Everybody was born into the sin boat. And if I'm honest, even Kristen was born into the sin boat. We were born into it. And listen, Here's what this means is when I got my boat, okay, my actual boat, um, it was bad from the moment that I bought it. And what I later learned 
is that one of the previous owners had actually stored this boat with the plugs in, and it filled up with water. Okay, it filled up with water. And you could actually see a water line, a faint water line inside the hull of the boat where, where water had actually gotten above the floorboard. So the carpet was like covered in moss. It had been stored with water inside of it. And because of that, everything inside was corroded. The motor was corroded and rusted. The inside was rotting. The whole boat was corroded. And a boat being full of water for a long time, it means from that point on, it's dying a slow death. Okay, it's dying a slow death. And all future owners will be affected by the sin of that previous owner. All future occupants of that boat will be affected by the mistake of that previous owner. Right? That's the way that works from that. And it's so funny, being young and dumb. Because when you go and buy something, um, you just think, I'm going to get this and it's going to be amazing. Right? We're kind of naive about it. I remember when I was first looking for a boat, I asked a friend of mine, his name is Dave Fieldhouse, to come and help me buy this boat. Right? So he came with me and I brought him along as an expert. And I said, Dave, if there's something wrong, I just want you to be totally honest with me. But uh, I like most, have you ever gone to a purchase and, and you've already made the purchase in your brain? Like, I made this purchase. Like, I went and I was going to buy this boat regardless, right? We get to the boat and Dave looks at the boat and he goes, that thing's trash. Don't buy it, John. And I was like, you don't know what you're talking about. I know what I'm talking about, okay? I'm going to buy this boat. He's like, no, John, this boat is bad. Don't buy it. Don't do it, okay? I said, Dave, it's just a little rust. Never rust. A little rust never hurt anybody except for tetanus. That hurt a lot of people. But I'm not going to get tetanus from this boat. I'm buying it. And here's the thing. I don't know if you're, if you're like me, but I know nothing, but I have experts around me sometimes, and I try to convince the experts to agree with me. Okay? I didn't like this boat, or I love this boat. The experts told me it was a bad deal. I was like, no, 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 you don't understand. It's just cosmetics. It's just cosmetics. I don't mind. It's going to run fine despite all the signs that it won't. I'm going to believe everything is okay. I'm going to buy the boat and believe it's okay, but everything was not okay. And I bought the boat and it was not okay, right? Because a previous owner had caused the boat to be fundamentally flawed, and everyone in the boat thereafter was in a doomed boat. Through Adam, through Adam, sin entered the world. Okay, he is the previous boat owner who flooded the boat. And everyone in his boat, which is all of us, we are all the children of Adam, right? We are all born through Adam, the first person on earth, okay? Everybody born in the boat thereafter is in a boat that is fundamentally flawed. And I want you to understand our perspective is fundamentally skewed because it's the only boat we've ever known, right? So we're in this, and deep in our hearts we're like, man, it should be easier in this. But, but the reality is it's the only experience we have is that boat that we were born into. And this is the boat where you don't need to be a Christian, by the way, to believe this. You know there's something off about life. You know, I don't need to convince you about this. Even if you don't believe in God, you're like, man, I feel like I was made for more, right? That's a feeling that we have. And evolution wouldn't speak to this. You would think that if evolution were real at this point, humanity would be working better together and reaching like new levels of peace and prosperity as, you know, we evolve to be more peaceful creatures as we realize that our prosperity is tied to one another, and yet that's not the case. I think what happens is we pretend like the, the, the boat and sin are fine or fixable, right? That's what we do. We say it's not that big a deal. It's fine. It's fixable. We can fix it. We can fix this. And today the term sin is controversial. It's a controversial term. Secular society says, oh, sin's no big deal. You do whatever you want as long as it makes you happy in the moment, right? And P.S., also secular society says don't talk about the Bible. Like those are like the two big things, right? You do whatever you want. Don't talk about sin. Don't talk about the Bible. The irony is sociologically, as a matter of fact, statistical fact, what makes us happiest and most prosperous as a society is embracing the ethics, morality, belief system, and faith of Jesus. One of my favorite books is called Coming Apart by Charles Murray, secular academic Charles Murray, very famous, almost won Nobel Peace Prize, amazing, amazing guy, right? And in his book, he concludes that Christians are usually more productive members of society, as a matter of fact, okay? More generous members of society and longer living, happier members of society than their non-Christian counterparts. He says, embracing the teachings of Jesus as a country, regardless of whether it's true or not, he doesn't believe it's true. He just says it's good for society because, listen, listen, I know that sin is real. And when you reject sin in your life and you say, I'm going to choose to honor God's plan for my life, you're going to have a better life because God knows. He teaches. That's why he says sin is sin. Sin is real. And here's the thing. Here's the thing. I know sin is real because I have children, Right? You don't have to teach kids to be evil. They are born totally evil. I'm convinced the reason why my son was not born with a whole man body, you know, he's born a little boy, is because he would murder me in his fits of rage. It's true, you know? Everybody says house cats are bad because if they were bigger, they'd eat you. Yeah, you know what else? Your kids are bad because if they were bigger, they'd also kill you. It's true. You don't have to teach them to be bad. You have to teach them to be good. 
I think the most recent trend in society that I see is people saying, no, 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 you don't understand, John. I mean, sin, the term sin, it's kind of old-fashioned. I mean, everything's okay, okay? I just don't think that sin is real. I'm, I'm not, and this is what I always hear, okay? I'm not a bad person, okay? I'm not, I'm not that bad a person. What everybody does, okay? They say, Pastor, I'm not a bad person, and, and, and here are the worst things that I've done to prove to you that they're not that bad. And the list is always some variation of, yeah, I've stolen a few things and slept around and gossiped. Maybe I've used some drugs when I was younger and, and driven drunk a few times, but I'm not, that, I'm not a serial killer. And I'm always like, did you, did you just hear that list, though? I mean, like, that's you know, stolen and slept with somebody else's future husband or wife and gossip and betrayed people that you love and use drugs. And then you've driven drunk, which the difference between you and somebody who's committed first degree manslaughter is you got lucky, right? And then you say, I'm not a serial killer. That's a pretty low bar. Like when you have to go to, I'm not a serial killer. It's like, just like me with the boat, right? Dave, it's not a bad boat. It's a good boat. Okay, you don't understand, like, it's going to be fine and everything's okay. Don't tell me, don't tread on me, don't judge my boat, because I've already bought this boat, Dave. Don't tread on me. I'm going to buy it, and it's great, and it's going to be fine. And Dave's like, you don't understand, though. It won't be. It won't be, right? I think the truth is we know sin in our hearts is real. Like Romans 2.15 talks about this. It says, they demonstrate that God's law is written on their hearts for their own conscience and thoughts either accuse them or tell them they're doing right. I think this is why people find talk of sin so offensive, right? It's because the truth is we understand that it's sin. If you know something is 100% false, it doesn't really bother you, right? I mean, I have somebody who pretty much twice a year comes up to me and says, hey, you're a terrible pastor and a bad preacher, right? They give that to me like twice a year. And I know I'm not the best pastor in the world. I know I'm not the best preacher in the world, but I know I'm not terrible. So when they come to me and say that, it's like, okay, well, that's your opinion. That's fine. You know, it doesn't really affect me because it's false. I know it's not true, right? Um, but when somebody, like my wife, comes to me and convicts me of something that I know is kind of true, but I've been trying to pretend like it's not true, I get defensive. What do you mean? Don't talk to me about it. I get angry, right? It affects me because I'm trying, I'm trying to create this house of cards where that reality isn't true. I'm trying to avoid that thought. When you have people reacting so strongly against Christianity and secular society, especially when they don't react against any other world religion, right? Secular, especially progressives, they have no problem with the religion of Buddhism or the religion of atheism or the religion of Islam, right? But with Christianity, it's different because Christianity is true. And deep in our hearts, we know that, right? Something doesn't come from nothing. I look at the superstitious religion of, of, of atheism, right? I mean, we know it's not true. It's not a big deal. It's not offensive when somebody's like, well, whatever. We know something doesn't come from nothing. It's no big deal. You can pretend like it's true, whatever, but it doesn't really matter, right? But when it comes to Jesus and all of Scripture and the way that it transcends ages, fulfilled prophecy, all this stuff, we don't want to hear that we have a higher power or an authority in life. So we rebel against the truth because we don't want to hear it. Just like I rebelled against Dave. Dave, don't tell me that that boat's bad, okay? Don't tread on me. It's a good boat, right? Don't. Don't give that to me. I know some of you are like, okay, I believe that God is real. But why is God so nosy? He's just so nosy. I mean, why does he care about things like sin? He's like a nosy neighbor. And that's not it at all. God's not a nosy neighbor who looks at you and just wants you to, you know, do his little things and march through and jump through his hoops. No, no, no. He says, hey, man, I know that your boat is fundamentally flawed. Like, please don't buy it. Please don't do this. Please don't get into this because I don't want you to experience something bad. He's a loving father. And he looks at you, he says, don't do this because it's going to hurt you, right? He's just like Dave with me with the boat. Don't buy it. I know it's going to be a big mistake. It's going to hurt you. What we always do is we pretend like sin is not a big deal. And I love, the Bible has a perfect description of the way that sin plays out in our minds, okay? James 1.15 really clearly talks about the pr progression of sin in life. I want you to see this because it's so powerful to me. It says, then after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. This is just like me with the boat. We start saying, oh, it's not a big deal. I mean, it's going to be fine, right? In our minds, oh, it's just a little desire. It's just a little baby sin. What's the big deal? A little white lie, a little bit of this, none of it. It's just a little flirting. What's, I don't understand what the deal is with that. And young people of all generations, not just millennials, young people, uh, you know, the Gen Xers when they were young or baby boomers when they were young, what we do is, is we underplay the effect of sin in our lives. Just a little desire, right? It's just not that big a deal. It's just, it's just a little sex for intimacy's sake. It's just a little responsible drunkenness with friends, right? We've got a designated driver. Just a little gossip for fun. What's the harm in these things? And statistically, you're hurting your life satisfaction. As a matter of fact, your loving Heavenly Father wants you to not have to go through that because you're lowering the satisfaction you reap from this life. It's like me saying, oh, it's just a little corrosion. What's the big deal, right? It's just a little rod on the inside of the hull. I don't understand. But eventually, it's going to be a big problem. And this verse nails it. This is exactly what we do. We say, I don't get what the big deal is. It's just a little desire, 
right? It's just a little white lie. It's just a little bit of gossip. I don't understand why God has to care about all these little things, right? And anyone who's older than 30, okay, you know this. Even if you're not a Christian, you know that this is true. You know that these little itty-bitty desires, they start off as something that's not that big a deal. But all of us who are a little bit older, we've experienced sin going from itty-bitty baby, little cute baby, little desire, get born, little baby, little white lies, cute, and all of a sudden turns into a monster in our life that's killing us, right? We've all experienced that happen. Oh, you know, I'll just meet her after work because we've been working together. You know, I mean, it's just a little flirting. I mean, it's nothing really harmful. You know, I'm going to be true to my wife or whatever. I'll just, you know, all of a sudden, you know, you're alone in a car together and it turns into an affair and you cross a line. You think, man, I never thought I would be here. This little baby sin, it turns into something that is a monster and it's, right? Uh, oh, I'll just smoke a little wheat. Not a big deal, right? Maybe a few oxys with it. Now we're melting the oxys and injecting them. It turns into something, a life-destroying drug addiction. It just started off as a little baby desire. What's the big harm in wheat? I don't understand. You know, it's not the big. Gossip. Oh, it's just a little gossip. I don't understand. What's the harm? All of a sudden, relationships are broken for a lifetime. Trust is broken, right? Because it was just a little, little bitty baby. And it grew up into a full-grown monster that brings death in our life. And this is what I love about the Bible is it gets it totally right about sin. And you don't have to be a Christian to see the wisdom in this, okay? You don't have to be a believer in Jesus to understand that thousands of years before sociology would discover something, Jesus revealed the truth to us. And people say it's drunkenness. They say it's sex. It's not a big deal. But nobody who's 80 years old, or very few people who are 80 years old, say, oh, yeah, I wish I would have lived in more debauchery when I was younger. I wish I would have parted. You know what I mean? Nobody who's 80 looks back and says, oh, I wish I would. No, no, what they always say is, I wish I would have done more good in my life. Even if they don't believe in Jesus, because we understand intrinsically that sin leads to death always. It's the way that it works, right? And here's why. Even though we think the boat can be repaired, even though we think that it's fixable, even though we think that sin is fine, here's the truth. The sin boat is sinking. It is irreparably damaged. The ultimate problem with my boat and other boats like it isn't just that the engine is corroding. It's that the inside of the hull um, is actually rotting away. And a lot of people don't know this about old ski boats, but old ski boats, even though they're fiberglass on the outside, there's wood on the inside. There's these big structural members that go from the bow of the boat to the stern of the boat called stringers. And uh, they're actually wood beams that are encapsulated in fiberglass. There's a boat down the street. My dad was like, John, you should buy that boat. You should just, you know, it's just right there. And you get it and you sold your boat and go get that one. I said, I'm not going to buy that boat. That boat has the same fundamental issue that my boat has. Here's a picture of a boat similar to it, right? And this is a, a, a pretty new boat. You look on the inside and it has these wood stringers, right, that are encapsulated in fiberglass. This is the inside of the hull of that boat. And you can see this wood is just totally rotten. They took the top off of this encapsulated fiberglass. It's terrible, right? It's going rotten. And what will happen is that boat can break in half or what usually happens with these boats is, is the motor is mounted to these stringers. The, the motor mounts go right into these wood stringers right here. And uh, when those stringers go rotten, the motor starts to shake loose and it, and it's connected to the prop shaft that goes through the hull. And as, as the prop shaft begins to vibrate inside of that little you know, hole in the hull, the hole gets bigger and bigger and bigger, much faster, and eventually the boat sinks. And a lot of people are like, oh, yeah, it's no big deal. You know, I mean, it's just, it's just some rotten stringers. What could possibly go wrong? Well, the boat will sink. The water corrodes and mechanicals and rots the structure, just like sin. And every single old ski boat is in the process of doing this, right? I think we see this in our lives, too. Rich, poor. Successful, not successful. There's this sort of meaninglessness that hits us as we realize that no matter what we do, we're all going to reach the same end. It's this fundamental feeling in our heart that we realize, man, I was made for more than this. The Bible says that eternity was written on all of our hearts. And no matter how much effort we put into finding satisfaction, we're not going to get it because we were made for more. We were born into this sinful boat. It might not seem fair. I know some of you say this morning, well, it's not fair. John, I was born into this boat. I mean, I didn't do it. Adam did it. It's not fair. I'm not arguing that it's fair, right? You look at a, a, a baby born addicted to heroin because of the choices of its mother, right? And you hold that baby, and it's crying, and it's crying because it's in withdrawal from the moment it was born. That's sad. That's sad. And it's not fair. But it's also true. I think a lot of people have a hard time facing the reality that, hey, we're born into this boat by no choice of our own. We were born totally sinful to the core of our being from the moment we were born, and you might say, well, that's not fair. That's not fair. I'm not arguing that it's fair, but it is true. It is true. And you don't have to be a Christian to see that that's a part of our life. Through Adam, the first bad owner of the boat, we were all born into sin. It is irreparable, and it is unfixable through our own actions. We're stuck in this situation that's leading to decay. And this is why God sent Jesus to us. I want you to see verse 15 here. It says, but there is a great difference between Adam's sin and God's gracious gift. And this is why I think Christianity is so offensive today. 
Okay? I think Christianity is super offensive because it's unique among world religions, right? Look at the religion of atheism or the religion of Buddhism or the religion of secular humanism or the religion of Islam or others. They all teach, be a good person, right? You be a good person. Atheism and Buddhism, which are essentially the same thing, one's just older than the other, say, hey, you just alleviate human suffering and you're a good person. Islam says, let your good deeds outweigh your bad deeds and you're a good person. You've repaired the boat. But Christianity, but Jesus teaches something totally different. He says, the boat of sin into which we were born was fundamentally and completely flawed. It cannot be fixed by what we do. And then he introduces something totally new. He says, we need a new and better and different boat. We need to get a boat that is fundamentally different. And he gives us this new boat. I want you to see this. He says right here, for the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to rule over many. But, but even greater is God's wonderful grace, his gift of righteousness. For all who receive it will live in triumph over sin and death through this one man, Jesus Christ. I want you to get this review here, okay? Um, I bought a boat. It was a bad boat because of the actions of a previous owner right? I pretended like the boat was fine and fixable. Don't tread on me, Dave. I'm buying it. It's going to be fine. The truth is the boat was irreparably damaged. And I realized, man, I can't fix this boat. There's nothing I can do. I got to get a different one. Praise God. Okay. He's, here's the deal in life. We were born into a sinful boat. We pretend like the boat and sin are fine or fixable, right? It's not that big a deal. But the truth is our life is irreparably damaged by sin. No matter how good we are, we cannot fix it. We need a new and better boat. In 1993, there was a boat company, a revolutionary boat company called Malibu Boats. And they released a boat, a new kind of boat, called a Malibu Echelon that had 100% composite stringers. There was no wood inside the boat at all. The boat issue was fundamentally fixed. I actually bought one of these the day before yesterday, right? It's a 93 Malibu Echelon. It's 25 years old. Don't judge me, okay? It's older than my other boat. But this one's all composite. Original edition. It'll never rot. I want you to understand, Jesus lived a life that would never rot or decay. He is a boat that has been fundamentally fixed, okay? He brings something brand new. He took great care to live a life with no sin in it. There was no wood in it. It will never rot. It is eternal. It will never, ever decay. That's the truth of the gospel. And I want you to see this right here. Becoming a Christian means admitting that our sin boat cannot be fixed by our own efforts. We need God to give us a new boat, right? That's where Christianity begins. The whole passage, the whole book of Romans is sort of summed up in this one obscure verse in the middle of it, right? He's talking about sin. He's talking about Adam. He's talking about Christ. And then in Romans 6, 23, he gets to really the heart of the issue. He gives a summary of the whole thing. He says, for the wages of sin is death, but the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. What you earn from sin, what you earn from the Adam boat is separation from God. It's talking about spiritual death right here. Okay? Not just biological death. It's saying that when we die, the definition of spiritual death is you cannot be in God's presence. That's spiritual death. You're cut off from God completely. So as a result of sin is you can't be with God. You're going to sink. But the free gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. This to me is a summary of the whole Bible right here. It says when you ask Jesus to forgive your sins and lead your life, what you're doing is you're saying, Jesus, I need you to give me a new boat. I need you to transfer me from my old boat. I admit that I am a sinner, sinful by nature, and that maybe compared to other people, maybe compared to serial killers, maybe compared to my neighbor, I'm a good person. But compared to you, compared to your standard, compared to your perfection, I can't make it. I can't hack it in eternity. I need your grace in my life. By grace alone, God's grace alone in our life. I, need, I didn't earn it. I don't deserve it, but I need it. Jesus, would you give it to me? That's where Christianity begins. I don't want you to miss the power of this. Paul is addressing the fundamental issue in all of our hearts. That deep yearning for more. I was made for more question. His clear understanding of this particular issue is what allowed Christianity to storm the world. This is the issue that transformed the world. The reason I'm a Christian isn't just because it's true. And I talk about evidence up here all the time, right? All the evidence. Right? And God does give us a ton of evidence. Christianity is real. Archaeologically, historically, scientifically, I don't have enough faith to be an atheist. I don't have enough faith to all, follow other religions because to me, I, I see the evidence. I'm like, this is dogma and superstition where, where here's this one unique religion that transforms the world for the better that has all of this stuff backing up, and that's great. But the real reason I chose to follow Jesus is he answered this fundamental made-for-more question. Paul shows us what more is. He's acknowledging that, yes, you were made for more. This is not all there is. In Christ, you can have the more that you've always wanted. And when you do it, it transforms everything. I feel like so many people know this, but don't actually believe it. I want to speak for a moment to this specific town. 
Because I feel like in this town, there's a lot of quote-unquote Christians who are like, oh yeah, I, b- I believe in Jesus, right? I want to remind you that the devil believes in Jesus. I think there's lots of people believe that this boat is here. The problem is we're still trying to repair our old boat, right? We're still trying to justify ourselves with God by our actions, right? Oh yeah, I know, I know, we're saved by grace alone. But in the core of our heart, we don't really believe that we are sinful, right? Sinful, born sinful. We don't believe that. Oh, yeah, I'm not that bad a person. You know, I mean, I go to church and I give and, you know, I don't eat pork and I read KJV only or whatever it is that you do, whatever floats your boat, right? No pun intended. Or no, pun intended. Yeah, pun definitely intended there. And here's the truth. It just seems so silly to me that we continually get stuck in this, but I know so many Christians who feel like good people because of actions. Our actions do not make us right with God. We are saved by His grace and mercy alone poured out into our lives. That's it. That's it. That's the only way that we're made right with God. I grew up in a tradition where I believe this, okay? And I, I, man, I I went to church all the time with my family, but I thought it was my actions that made me right with God. And our our church didn't intend to do this, but the, the, the unintended message that I got was, we're better than all the other churches because we do it this specific way. And that wasn't, I don't think that's what the pastors intended. That's not, but that's, that's the message I got. Okay. And I want to make it clear. That's not what makes people good people. The boat is fundamentally flawed. It cannot be repaired apart from the grace of God in our lives. And if your attitude is, I'm a good person because of what I do, I want to say this as lovingly and as clearly as possible. You're completely missing the point. I want you to know the best truth you can hear right now is, is you are not a Christian if that's what you believe. Okay? You might have religion, but you're missing out on the fundamental work of Christ in your life. I want you to see this one more time. We're born into the sin boat. We pretend that the boat and sin are fine or fixable, but the sin boat, it's sinking and irreparably damaged. We need a boat. We need a new boat. And I want, you to, I want you to hear this last part. Here's my fifth and final point. Only Jesus can rescue us and give us a new boat. Only Jesus can do that. He's the only one who can bring us from this situation right here to this one. He's the only one who lived a sinless life. He's the only one who has composite stringers that will not go rotten. That's it. You put yourself in his boat. Christianity doesn't begin until we say, God, I'm flawed in my heart and I need you to rescue me. We put aside our pride and we just admit that to him. I just feel like today we have this issue where we say we believe in Jesus, but it's like we look at life and we live with no faith. I remember a funeral I did years and years ago for this family. This lady was like 95 years old, you know, when she passed. She was like a perpetual prayer request for the last decade, you know, her health issues and whatever. And I'm sitting around, you know, the table with this family, and they're just so devastated. They're like, oh, this was all so sudden. You know, I wish she could have just had a few more years. It was just too soon. And I was like, really? She's 95? Like, you didn't see this coming? You know, we're all going to die. And I think, I think what they were forgetting is that Jesus answered the made for more question. I think there's so many of us who pretend like, We have a relationship with Jesus, but we don't. We don't. We don't really trust his grace. We still are trying to fix this old boat. We're still trying to repair this thing. We're still trying to use our actions rather than relying by faith alone, through grace alone, in Christ alone, his work in our lives. We're just trying to repair our old boat. And listen, unless and until you ask Jesus to forgive your sins and lead your life, unless and until you admit, God, I am born sinful, you are not a Christian. I want you to know when I gave my life to Christ after living in religion for many years, I have a purpose and a hope for the future. I don't need to compete with other people. I don't need my actions to make me feel like a better Christian. I just, I live a life of gratitude and joy. That's what Christ does. There's no competition. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. I'm not competing. I'm not looking down on other people. I'm in this boat because of Jesus. Jesus won for me and I'm living in his freedom and promises. I'm living in the more today. Like each day has purpose. I was made for more, but I'm living in the more today. That's the more that you were made for. I have a hope and a future life makes sense. And here's what all this comes down to, okay? I know some of you, part way into this message, you're like, oh, he's gonna do a big gospel invitation. This is for all the new people, new to church. No, it's not. This is for every person, no matter how long you've been following Jesus or if you're new to Christ. I really want you to examine your heart today and say, man, which boat am I in based on the actions of my heart? Right? Based on the deepest convictions in my life, really, am I living in the grace of Jesus or am I relying on my actions? Because here's my fear. The Bible talks all the time about so many people who say, oh yeah, you know, I'm a Christian, whatever, and they stand before the God at the end of our life. And God says, you know what? No. 
you didn't have that. I want our church to really have an opportunity to think about the gospel and say, man, have I really received the grace of Jesus in my life? Am I really relying on his grace in my life? I just want to ask heads to bow and eyes to close in a moment of privacy and concentration. What boat are you living in? What are you relying on in your life for purpose? I think for so many of us, it's our accomplishments and our actions, but only the grace of Jesus gives us the more that we want. If you're hearing this message today and you're like, man, this, this is me. I am in the boat of Adam. I am in this boat that I'm constantly trying to repair. I am living outside the grace of Jesus and I want that in my life. Why not make today your day? If you just want to admit, Jesus, I, I believe I'm a sinner. Today I realize that maybe for the first time in my life or I'm ready to admit that for the first time in my life and I want your grace. Would you lift up your hand right now and say, yeah, pastor, that's me. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see hands all over the place. See you guys. I see you. I just ask you to pray in your heart with me. Lord Jesus, I admit that I'm a sinner, sinful by nature, born into sin. Today, I accept, believe, and receive that Jesus in his perfect sinless life, his death in my place can pay for my sins. And today, I just, I ask that you would give that grace to me, Jesus. I turn my life over to you as my leader and forgiver. And today, I believe that you are making me into a new creation. From this day forward, I choose to walk in your grace alone. Christ, I give you faith. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen and amen. Can we give a round of applause for dozens of people who chose to follow Jesus? I think that's so cool. I had to lay this foundation for this series. This is the foundation of Made for More. Now, next week, I've got some important stuff that I want to talk to you about. And I just want to give you a quick trailer of what's happening next week, okay? So we're living in the grace, but we're living by God's grace um, in our life. A lot of people say, well, what does that mean about sin then? Can I just sin because I live in God's grace and his grace covers me, whatever I do? Well, Paul says, um, uh, well, then, should we keep on sinning so that God can show us more and more of his wonderful grace? Of course not. Since we have died to sin, how can we continue to live in it? And that's cool. So, so, so Paul says, okay, don't sin anymore once you become a Christian. That's, that's great. That's good direction. But for me as a Christian, that's kind of discouraging because I sin more. You know, what do you do about that? What do you do? Well, then Paul, a few verses later in chapter 7, he goes, I don't really understand myself. <clears throat> for I want to do what is right, but I don't do it. I'm a Christian, but I keep sinning. Instead, I do what I hate, right? Well, if we become a new creation, we're living in this new boat. God says don't sin anymore, but Paul still sins and we still struggle with sin. What's the deal with that? How much sin is okay? Why is it that I'm a Christian, but I still struggle with sin? I want to have a frank conversation about that next week. I think it'll be helpful. You're not going to want to miss it. It's going to be a great week. I'm excited to talk to you guys about that. Right now, Christian's going to come out and uh, lead us in the next part of this service.